If you've ever watched blacksmith videos where they deform metals, they heat treat them, they deform them some more, they keep going back and forth in this process, you are witnessing one of the core concepts of deformation mechanisms in material science, and this is recovery, recrystallization, and grain growth. All right, let's dive into it. When you plastically deform metal, when that blacksmith smacks it with his hammer, you are increasing the dislocation density, right? You're generating dislocations. You're changing the grain shape and orientation, and you're producing strain hardening in this process, right? Basically, you're damaging the lattice. You're changing the shapes of these grains. They're going from nice round ones to flattened out ones. They start to look like this. Here's an example of a metal that's been cold rolled. So they send it through a roller over and over and over, and that's flattening out the grains over time. So you're changing the, the grain microstructure. You're filling it with dislocations, and it's getting quite hard in the process, right? Well, we know that a blacksmith, if he keeps on doing this, eventually it'll break. You can't just like pound on a piece of metal endlessly. It will break. So you can uh, imbue it again to have ductility by heat treating it. We call this annealing in material science. Annealing is a heat treatment intended to um, reduce the internal strain in the material and to reduce the dislocation density. You have to heat this up at relatively high temperatures because what you need is atomic motion, right? If you think of these impurities, right, all these dislocations, you need the dislocation over here and this dislocation to be able to orient themselves such that now they're lined up like that and then they can recombine, right? They feel this attractive force, they can recombine and then annihilate, right? And that all takes motion, right? That's atomic motion, which means you're relying on diffusion, atoms moving around, and that happens at high temperatures. So it relies on high temperatures, okay? Um, now, once you recover it, you basically, you're trying to like take a lattice that was really damaged and filled with impurities, and you're trying to fix it by allowing things to move around a little bit. But it might be the case that your, that your lattice was so damaged and so um, misshapen from the deformation that occurred to it that it might be better overall for it to just grow new strain-free grains. You're going to grow new strain-free grains with lower dislocation densities out of the old ones. So the old lattice is basically so crap. It's like when you buy like a house that's so junky that you're like, I can't just like flip this place. I have to just bulldoze it and start over. That's recrystallization. If it's recovery, then you move in and you flip the house. You're like, yeah, the bones are okay. I'm just going to like clean it up a little bit. That's recovery. Recrystallization is plowing the house down, right? And then once you do grow uh, brand, brand new grains, these grains grow and get larger. That's called grain growth, right? Recrystallization is an interesting process. It happens at about... Um, uh, typically between a third and one half of the melting point. There's something called the recrystallization temperature, and that's when you get complete recrystallization in one hour. So whatever temperature causes all of your old nasty grains to get replaced by nice new ones in one hour is the recrystallization temperature, right? Um, and this is sort of a schematic of what's happening at the microstructure during this process. You can see here's the uh, grain size, which correlates to ductility and strength correlating to hardness, right? You can see uh, as you increase the amount of cold work, what's happening? Well, we know that strength goes up. It's getting harder and stronger as you cold work it, right? Those are both increasing up here. But we know that ductility is falling off. We're losing ductility. And we're probably changing our grain size slightly. We're probably reducing our grain size as we cold work this. Now, if you take that and you put it in an oven and you start to heat it to higher and higher temperatures, here's what you see. Initially, at this low temperature regime, not a lot's happening. You're getting what's called recovery. Basically, all you're going to be able to do there is clean up the microstructure. If it was filled with defects, maybe you can start to get rid of some of those defects. But if you reach a certain temperature right here, shown with this dotted line, that's when you get recrystallization. Now entirely new grains are growing. You can see like here they are, like these little tiny grains. They started to grow there, and now they're getting larger and larger until you get complete recrystallization there. All of your old flattened out grains have been replaced by these nice round ones. So at the end of that, look what's happening to your strength and your hardness. They're falling off. You're losing all your strength and your hardness as you recrystallize, but you're gaining all that ductility. Your grain size, which was tiny, slowly is starting to grain, uh, slowly starting to grow. Now, as you keep on heating this, you lead to this grain growth regime where your grains get larger and larger. Your grains are taking off, which means your ductility is getting higher, but your strength and hardness are continuing to fall as you grow these things larger and larger because we know that small grains are strong metals. Okay, So that's what's happening during recovery, recrystallization, and grain growth. And you can see lots of schematics of this happening. Again, 
what's happening here. It was a really damaged lattice, so you heat it up enough, and these little tiny grains, those are new defect-free grains. They grow, they're sort of equiaxed. Instead of being like these ones filled with dislocations, these have low dislocation density. You heat it up and you get grain growth, right? So um, recrystallization temperatures, we already talked about, they're typically between a third and a half. They can be as high as even 0.7 of the melting point, and they really allow you to tune the, the, the properties, the mechanical properties of your metal, okay? Let's talk about grain growth for a minute. Why does grain growth happen? Well, take a look at this. Look at all the black lines here. If you added up all those black lines, it's much more in this one than this one. Black lines represent grain boundaries. Grain boundaries have surface energies. So the smaller your grains, the more surface energy that you have to deal with. So crystals don't want surface energy. They want to get rid of it by combining these together. So grains grow. There's some pretty cool simulations of this. Take a look at this one. Here they're showing a simulation of grain growth. You can see that when it starts, look, the little ones get smaller. They get absorbed by the large ones. So this one here, it's smaller than its neighbor. So it's getting absorbed while this one grows. And these will just continue like that. Small grains get swallowed by the large grains until all the gr small ones get consumed and it just keeps on growing. So your grain size can get larger and larger and larger, and you can get really big. You can get grains so big that you can see them with your naked eye, big old macroscopic grains. Um, but remember, in this process, what's the trade-off? You're losing strength and hardness. You're getting much more ductility, but you're losing strength and hardness as you do grain growth, right? The process of grain growth sometimes gets called Ostwald ripening, and again, that's the process where big grains grow at the expense of small grains, all right? Um, there is some expressions that you can use to simulate grain growth, right? So d to the n, that's your grain size to some exponent, right? It's a constant for your material. Minus d naught to the n. d naught will be your initial grain size equals k, another constant, times temperature. So if you knew the constants k and n and your initial grain size, then if we held it in a furnace at some temperature for a time t, then you could figure out what your final grain size would be. Therefore, uh, K and N are time-independent constants, but they are definitely temperature-dependent. If you go to a higher temperature, there's no reason to believe that you'll, the K and N won't change. They're going to change as well, right? N is typically a number greater than 2. Um, okay, so that's grain growth. There's lots more about that in other courses in material science, but that's all we're going to cover today.